Okay, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Elaine and I'm the learning strategist here at the Mount. Um, Denise and I will be uh, just facilitating um, the session this evening. Um, let me just check. I've lost my title page, so bear with me. <laughs> but this evening we're going to talk about um, reading uh, and finding and reading digital sources um, that you may use for completing assignments and also completing um, your writing as you go through your academic writing and other similar, similar tasks. Um, so our goals for this evening is, are the following. Um, we would like you to consider how to prepare for academic reading and writing and I'll focus mainly on that this evening. Um, I would like for you to consider your approach to reading and maybe think about working on some new approaches that can potentially uh, make your um, make your work a little bit more a um, little more productive uh, and efficient as you go through and, and just make your workflow overall a little bit better um, and know the importance of having some reading objectives as you go and, and find some different sources. Um, consider how to take notes when you're reading. Uh, maybe think about some graphic organizers and also thinking about increasing your reading speed as a student. Um, not your general reading speed, but uh, how, to, um, how to use the information that you have a little more efficiently. Um, the other thing I should mention before I actually delve into the, the slides and information this evening is that uh, we will be uh, kind of working back and forth and I'll be speaking first this evening and then Denise is going to show you some very practical uh, ways of actually finding information using the library website. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Um, for those of you that are learning Passport students, we will give you our information at the end of the session. For me, you can uh, take a picture of your Learning Passport page. If you're a distance student, you already have a document that you can send along. And um, I will put my email in at the bottom here and you can send it back to me. Um, Denise, did you have anything to say before I get started? Well, just that um, we, I can also um, sign the uh, passports for the goals sort of connected with the library. Um, I'll be on campus tomorrow and you can also, if you're a distant student, um, e email me the, um, the page uh, for the learning passport and I'll send you the survey to do and then um, sign your passport as well. So back over to Elaine. Okay, and um, I've put my email in there, but um, Denise, I do think, has the survey that you'll need to complete to get your passport signed. But if um, you have any questions as well, you can always contact me through email if you need to. All right, so um, a very important thing to consider as you um, start to think about the various things that you need to do to complete assignments or prepare for an essay is not only just completing the work but actually considering a method for breaking down that work and managing the work in a specific way. Um, so when you're looking for articles and you're looking for sources to read and consider when you're doing that, you have to consider your purpose. So many times, and in fact most times when you're in university, at least in your undergraduate um, courses, you want to take a good look at those assignments and you want to consider uh, the outcomes of those assignments um, potentially is related rather to the outcomes of your course. So it's always a good idea to start with your course syllabus. Um, take a look at the course um, outcomes or expectations as written down and if, if that's not very clearly written out, take a look at the topics for your course because very often professors and instructors like for students to connect their assignments directly to the course topics. And so think about it in that way, whatever you do in a course is going to benefit you um, for studying, for learning your content, and so they're not separate things that you need to complete. So going to class and completing assignments are very much uh, inter interconnected. 
So it's really good to get a sense of what your course is all about if you haven't done that, and to revisit that every time you plan to begin planning to complete an assignment, whether it's an essay, whether it's an annotated bibliography, or it's a reflection, they should all be anchored in the expectations of your course. And so when you're reading, you might have an overall initial approach uh, based on an objective or a purpose. Um, and as you go to complete the smaller parts of an assignment, you might want to consider um, each time what your goal is when you're reading a specific uh, piece of an article. Um, it really depends, but always consider what your goal is each time. So a really good strategy for um, going through and, and reading the different parts of an article or even a textbook. Um, this one is, is mainly set for textbooks, but it's a series of smaller strategies that make up an overall approach. Um, and really, it it's, has multiple steps. And when you're looking at reading something for use, um, for whatever use you have for it, um, you don't want to just start to read at the beginning and read all the way through, because that's it's very likely that you might lose your focus, uh, you might forget your purpose, and um, initially your purposes are going to be figuring out how that content or how that text is organized. Once you have a better sense of how the text is organized, you are then able to move through and use that information in a much more efficient manner. So if you think about these uh, following steps as some potential things that you can do to kind of adapt to the way or the format that text is organized, um, you, might be, you might be more effective with actually using a piece of text. So the first thing you want to do is you want to consider taking a good survey of the text as a whole. So you may wish to, if it's a textbook, for example, go to the back of that textbook and look for the summary or the discussion part of the textbook. Usually it's about a paragraph or two. Sometimes the publishers, uh, I find these days, are getting a little savvy and they're kind of organizing it in smaller pieces or they're, they're listing it in a question format. I really like the little simple paragraph or two. It really sets the context. It's kind of a, it's a bit of a spoiler. You, you know it's coming then, but it, I like to think of it as one, one bookend um, just to kind of know where you're going and where you're headed when you have that overall kind of sense of what's happening in a textbook chapter. You can then um, be prepared because you're making connections at that point. And the more primers you have, the more little bits of information that are acting as hints, so the more you're able to do that for yourself, the better prepared you are to make connections and increase your reading comprehension as you move through a piece of text. Um, if you're, again, using a textbook, you might, you might also want to go back to the beginning of your textbook, and we're still in the survey part, and you may wish to look at your reading objectives or your textbook chapter objectives. Usually, in the case of a professor or instructor that is um, using a textbook very closely, in those cases, um, they may tend to use those objectives themselves as teaching objectives. So you will quickly get a sense if you start to um, if you start to look at your outcomes and consider them before you go to class, you'll quickly get a sense of whether or not your professors are using those outcomes as well to teach you. Um, the outcomes basically, they provide you with a focus. And so they might start with something like, in this chapter you will learn, or in this chapter you will see, or read, or understand. Um, so it's really good for you to take a look at those before you read. And it's not that you want to look at all of them at once, but you can maybe pick a particular one or prioritize based on the most important one according to what's in your course syllabus. And then you can read to find out more about a spe very specific topic. Um, another way of approaching that um, while you're still surveying the chapter is to get used to how the text is organized. Um, you might notice that there are headings and subheadings. There may be bolded words. There may be graphs and charts and pictures. Get a sense of how this book is laid out. And when you feel ready to actually start to read, um, you can start to even formulate some questions, which is the next step in this series of strategies. 
So you may wish to use some of the headings and turn some of those headings into a question format. That will prompt you as a reader to have a goal and to have a purpose for reading. When you get into a piece of text, you're then trying to answer your question. And so you're also priming yourself to act more like a, an investigative uh, student or, an in, or a researcher at that point because you're looking to solve something or you're looking to attain additional information about something. Um, and so questioning is a really good thing to do. And even if you're taking notes, another way of looking at this step is instead of using the textbook to create questions, you may also want to jot down some notes as you read um, and either formulate in a question what you have read um, so summarize and, and create a question. Or you may want to jot down things that you still are wondering about. So you may want to actually write questions that you still have. So maybe you can take those to class. Maybe you can uh, take a break and come back and try to read to answer your, your question, which means you need to read a little bit more deeply at that point. And so, of course, when you're reading, you want to focus on not reading your text all the way through from top to bottom and left to right, which is how we learn to read. Now you're looking for information, and at this point you already know how to read, and so don't get hung up on those beginning skills or beginner skills. So you want to read to answer questions. You want to read to learn more about specific topics. Um, and you also want to add that other little bit there. You want to add the other book end. So you have all of the content in the middle of your textbook. You have objectives at the beginning. You have a good little summary at the end, which is usually your little, uh, little paragraph or two. Now let's get into the nitty gritty, which is everything in the middle. But you don't need to do that all in one sitting, even at this point. So you may want to do that in advance of class and then go to class, take some notes, and then come back and read more deeply uh, according to what your professors are telling you. Because not every single piece of information in a piece of text is important. And so you must get used to prioritizing the information um, according to importance or, or in court, according to how well you know something or don't know something. And so it's good to consider which way you'd like to prioritize it or using which set of criteria. Another thing that you may wish to do as you're reading is talk. So when we talk and look at something, we are activating different parts of our understanding and we're processing in different ways. So we're taking that information and when we're talking about it and we're looking at it, it's also less likely that we will lose our focus. So now we've done a survey, we've set some goals, we've asked some questions, we've read a little bit, we've pre-read perhaps, maybe we've even gone to class, we're talking now to read more deeply, and we're almost pondering out loud by doing so. And at this point, we would have used the material, but in, you know, in little small pieces, quite a few different ways. And with all of that in place as a structure for reading, we're less likely to lose our focus, and we are more likely to have a deeper understanding of what we're reading. So at this point, you've done quite a few things if you've gone through all of these steps, reading something in a textbook. Then you want to leave it for a little bit and you want to come back to it. Again, I like the questions because if you've separated some questions from the text and you have those, you can almost begin to, to test yourself or self-test so that you can see if the information is actually sticking or if, it's, uh, if the information makes sense to you if you were to remove the book from your site at the, any particular point in time. Are you able, again, to, um, are you able to speak or write about something in the textbook, not verbatim, but are you able to summarize things in your own words? Are you able to um, remember or recall what you read based on your questions or based on your class notes? Um, an easier way to do that, which is our last step, is to actually ensure that you are trying to make some sort of connection to things that you already know. Um, so for those of you that have completed your uh, first year introductory um, psychology course, now if you're taking part two, for example, you may want to try to recall what you've learned in part one and you're probably building on that information now in part two. And so it's also a good reason not to get, uh, not to give up your textbooks each, chap uh, each term 
um, because you can always go back. Remember that textbooks are not storybooks. They may have stories in them. They may have, you know, pieces of novels in them. And although some of you are still reading novels, for those of you that particularly are in English, um, it's still OK to jump around because you're not reading for pleasure only. Um, that might also be the case, but you're, you're reading to critically analyze information. And so you must break it down. Um, analyzing means to break something down into its smaller parts so that later you can decide to do things with those little pieces of information. And so um, you might have some spoilers, like I had mentioned, but, but keep, keep reading in different ways. And sometimes it's OK just to jump right in. Um, jump right into the middle of a textbook and come back out. And at any point, if you notice that you're losing your focus, um, then it's time to stop and revisit your goal for reading. So always have a really good goal before you start to read. Now, there is a website um, that I won't show you tonight, but please take a look at it. It will also get you familiar um, with the parts of academic or peer-reviewed articles. And so just like the textbook has uh, typically has some standard parts, um, you may want to spend some time before you complete assignments this term and just simply get used to the little sections that are making up those larger articles. And also think about the hierarchy. Each section makes up an article and a series of articles make up a journal. So keep that in mind as well. You're taking a little snippet out of a magazine, which is something we tend to forget. Um, especially now that everything is digital. So don't forget to put things in context if you need to. So a scholarly article is one that is peer reviewed, which means it goes through, a, I think it's a fairly rigorous process um, by experts in a particular discipline. For you, you will have different, slightly different articles depending on the program. So nutrition articles and science articles may be uh, maybe similar in many regards. Um, again, you might have different pieces for those of you that are looking at historical articles or articles that speak about history. Um, psychology definitely has a different style to it. And a lot of times they're determined by their citation styles as well. So it is very worth your while just to go in even tonight when you're looking at the articles that Denise might show you, see if you can pick out right away where the abstract is. Because uh, the abstract is sort of like that little summary at the back of a textbook chapter. It's going to give you the, the, the big picture, so what's to come. And so it's going to prime you to make the transition into reading the entire article. And so luckily enough, that little summary in articles, uh, they tend to sit right at the front and they're called an abstract. You know, after the abstract, you might want to also, again, consider making another bookend um, and going to the back. And so going to the conclusion, sometimes it's called the discussion, um, and go there and see what happens. What were, what were the results of this particular piece of literature? Um, what were they investigating? Um, notice some of the references at the end. What do they look like? What kind of citation style are they using? Um, is this something you're expected to use as well? Um, when you try to connect the abstract and the conclusion, do they make sense to you? Do they actually give you a starting point, a reason for doing it, or a reason why the study was conducted? And then again, um, what happened as a result? Um, you might notice that it's might, it might uh, make a little bit of sense to you to go back to the introduction. And this, because you're primed and you know it's coming, this will begin to fill in the details. and it is to your benefit if you can almost picture yourself as being one of the researchers who wrote the article. So picture yourself working with the participants. What do they look like? Where are they sitting? Are they in a lab? Are they in a classroom? Are they, uh, you know, are they in a natural setting? So those things really matter to helping you supporting your memory. So make some, make some good educated guesses when it comes to that um, setting and introduction. And then go through and break up your main text or the main part of the article into smaller pieces. Um, don't use a highlighter, again, for a textbook or, uh, or an article. Don't highlight mindlessly. If you're going to highlight, make sure that you're highlighting to break your text up. Or you may want to highlight according to a particular code. So for example, maybe everything yellow would have to do with the main argument that an author is giving in an article. 
um, maybe in a textbook everything you put in yellow is a main idea or a big idea. Maybe everything that is pink with your highlighter is everything that supports that main idea. So you can use that sort of approach um, whether you're, using, you're reading an article or a textbook. Um, and take a look at the numbers, take a look at the figures, take a look at the stats, um, see if you can understand them, but then also go through the text, look for that same information in a text format and see if you can uh, kind of broaden your understanding of that as you go through. Um, again, look at the graphs and the charts, they may show you things that you maybe had missed in the text and uh, notice all of the separate parts all kind of before you go in and read. So using what you know about an article um, and knowing what your purpose is for completing an assignment or reading, um, only then should you really start to get in and read more deeply. So think of reading as layers. The first is like a get to know your setting kind of a, an activity. The next one is read a little bit in, in smaller pieces or smaller chunks and then revisit your purpose for reading and then go in and read more deeply and take off or often take breaks and think, am I still on track? What am I learning here? Um, what is the most important information? Should I be writing something down in a note? Um, for those of you that are like, that are note taking as you read, it's a really great way to support your memory. Um, a really simple way of knowing what kind of notes to take is to consider um, each of these pieces for your articles. It could be for textbooks, but this works really well for articles. So for example, what is the title of this article? What is it about? Why am I choosing to read it? Or why has my professor chosen it for me? Um, why was the study done? So you can think of the whys and the whats as in different ways. Um, why was it important to conduct a study? What was missing from the previous studies or the previous uh, reviews of literature, what was missing and why are they moving forward to look at this? Who is completing it? Um, meaning who is, uh, who is the researcher or re who are the researchers? Um, and who are the participants? What are they doing? And who will it benefit? And, uh, you know, how might this information be used to help the public? How can I use this to enhance my understanding as a student at the Mount? When was this article written? When was the study conducted? Um, for example, sometimes your professors might wish for you to look at more current articles. But um, in addition, there are times when they want you to look at some foundational studies, meaning, you know, something that maybe was conducted or, or written in the 1950s or the 1970s or the 1990s. Something that kind of was the foundation of everything since then. And sometimes they do get us to go back as students and read those things so that we can have an understanding of, um, of the whole timeline of how this, this field came to be or discipline came to be. And where did it happen? You know, where could be country, where could be, um, like I mentioned, the setting, could be a clinical setting, it could be a classroom. So those are all important things to know and important for you to take notes. And the other important thing to consider is what is the main purpose um, of the writer? What is the author trying to show or prove or explore? Um, what is the argument or the thesis of an article? That's really important as well. And take notes. So you can take notes in this format. You can take notes in a linear format. You can take uh, notes on cue cards. You can write little notes on, uh, on sticky notes and stick them all over an article. Um, but find a method that's really, um, really clear and can keep you on track. So if you were to leave your article for two days and then come back to it, you should be able to pick up exactly what you were reading and understand uh, and remember what you were reading a couple of days ago. If you are using articles um, to complete an assignment, I wouldn't recommend, however, leaving them for long periods of time. So you want that latent time to be short um, so you can facilitate that information moving from your short term to your long term memory. And you don't want to leave it too long because you may have to reread a lot if you do that. Oh, and I jumped ahead of myself. So generally speaking, you can use any kind of sticky note. Um, for those of you who are not uh, liking your own handwriting, 
You might want to download an app where you can record your voice. Um, so you can use an audio, you can keep an audio file. Um, you might want to use something like drag and dictate or text notes so that when you speak it records in a text format and then you can share it with yourself later. Um, funny enough though, I attended a webinar a couple of weeks ago and the researcher, um, he was researching students taking notes and they found that students who take notes by hand tend to have a better time remembering the content that they are reading and trying to study. So keep that in mind as well. But again, it all depends on you and how you work. Um, create your references, do that right away. So I like to keep my references and get them there right from the beginning. It's easier for me to save them at the start than it is to scramble and try to find them at the end of writing. And for those of you that are attending our session later on this evening, you might want to attend our 6 o'clock session to learn a lot more about that. Um, you can use your annotations, which are the little pieces and phrases that you write on the sides of your textbooks and articles to um, help prompt your memory to recall what you had read previously. And you might want to use some sort of outline. So you may want to prepare an outline in advance, some sort of advance organizer, um, which I will get to in the next slide. Um, and you might want to, um, you know, use some of the features that Denise will show you in a few minutes to um, have a, another way of documenting your annotations and little notes and questions. Again, you might want to plan something in advance. Um, if you're just kind of, if you're not too sure what or how the information might come, something just like a mind map, um, this is not really a mind map, but something like this where you just start in the center of a page and you just write as you go. Um, mind maps look a lot more flowy than this one, and I can um, kind of go through that a little bit at another time. Um, if you are trying to break things down and compare and contrast, you know, um, or keep track of what you've read and, and what kind of keywords you might want to use for searching later, um, you can use a matrix or a chart. Um, so consider what you're doing. So look at those assignments. Go back to your syllabus every time you start something. And look for the assignment word. So if you're defining something, you know, that would determine that you use a specific type of organizer. If you're analyzing something, it means you have to break it down. Maybe you'd have an, an organizer where you would um, uh, keep things in a hierarchy. So you start with your main topic and you kind of go from there. So it takes a little bit of practice, but um, if you like visuals, um, you might want to consider using something like that. And, and it's your work, so you can adjust it as you go. Um, you might make mistakes, and that's okay too, because when you make mistakes and fix them, um, while you're doing your work, that's great for your memory, that's great for learning, because really that is learning. And you may want to practice increasing your reading speed ever so slightly. Um, again, you don't want to read every single word. You don't need to. So skip all of the ahs, thes, tos, and just quickly look for keywords. So you can take a paragraph, identify keywords, and then contemplate those and whether or not you know them first. You can go back to that paragraph. You can uh, maybe speak aloud a little bit. You could maybe formulate a question. Um, time yourself when you read a paragraph. Um, use your phone, use a watch, and then work on just ever so slightly increasing that reading speed because you don't need to read every word and don't get bogged down by those details. So push yourself along the text with your finger, use a ruler, just read a little tiny bit faster and your comprehension may actually increase because when you read everything as a separate word, your comprehension um, can suffer because you might get distracted. So read to a, uh, to a pace that's really good for you and supports your understanding. And the minute you lose your focus, stop, reset that focus, and go in again. And also, you have a lot to read. So in university, you have a lot of content to read, and you have to read it very quickly. So you're going to get multiple articles. And for those of you that are in second, third, fourth year, you know this already. For any of you that are master's students, you know that the analyzing of uh, multiple sources can happen at once. And so you really have to be efficient with taking notes, recording ideas, and then kind of annotating and jotting down and all of that stuff, resources, kind of all at once. So developing a good system early is really important. 
and get familiar with that language. So um, look for the words that kind of direct you as a reader. So uh, things like, instead of saying the first, the second, and the third main points, um, in text, you might see something like, initially, this is the most important thing, um, then, and then you might see something like, finally, and they basically mean first, second, and third. So use your highlighter if you're having difficulty identifying main points, and kind of just put a little dot or put a little color to identify those words to help you be more efficient with reading the text. And of course, um, look for those words that are difficult or easily confusable. Um, there are some there are some pieces of software out there as well that can help you identify those things um, with reading and writing. So for any of you that are curious about some assistive software as well, I, I know a little bit about that. So come and see me as a learning strategist and you can learn more about that as well and how to fit those tools into your workflow in a way that works well for you. Again, some of those signal words, some of these words mean that you have to speed up a little bit because something else is coming. Or hold on a second, slow down because you have to think about this content because it might uh, be different from what you were reading initially or at least up until this point. And then, uh-oh, something's coming words. So therefore, consequently, in summary, you might find these at the end of paragraphs, at the end of sections, or at the end of an article, or even at the end of an abstract. So, phew, that's a lot for me. Um, overall, these are the things that we've covered this evening. Um, but as always, any student, whether you're distance or you're on campus, it doesn't matter to me. Um, we can meet online. We can meet in person. I'm in uh, the bottom floor of EMF, which is the library in 127F. Um, at the end, when Denise is speaking, I will type in my contact information. Um, I don't generally have many drop-in hours. I mainly do appointments, but I do have drop-in hours this term, um, even for distance students. So this Friday I have, it's a kind of a test, a drop-in session for my online students. So you can just drop right in from my website. So I'm going to hand it back over to Denise, and uh, she's going to show you a few neat things. Um, and these are things that you will use as a student at the Mount. Thanks, Eileen. So, you know, we've uh, learned a lot about, uh, like, reading, how to read, how to make notes, how to use this information. So I just want to take a, a few minutes to show you how to find these books and these journal articles. And then just to sort of connect a little bit of what uh, Elaine was talking about uh, with the the books and journal articles that you'll be finding online, just so that you know from the library, uh, you know, when you find the information, what you should be uh, doing and connecting, connecting with right away um, to make that whole process a lot, uh, a lot easier. So just one second, I'm just going to uh, share my screen with you. This usually takes a couple of seconds to, to make that happen. And it just seems to be a little bit slower today than usual, so my apologies for that. Great, so are you seeing the uh, Mount website on your screen? Okay, great. I got a little nervous there when I wasn't seeing any response. <laughs> okay, excellent. Okay, so uh, from the Mount home page, you just want to click on library. It's just right up at the, uh, the uh, top of the screen. And then at this point, um, you can uh, type in 
you're, of course, you need to scroll down to be able to see the uh, where to type it in. So where it says Nobina Discovery, this is a nice sort of general search that will find you both books and journal articles. So I'm just going to, let's, uh, we can, we've been talking about note-taking. When you're off campus, or if even when you're on campus and you've got your laptop, you will need to sign in. And we, although you can go as a guest, we advise you to sign in with the same login that you do for Moodle because you get more information if you're, you're a student. There are certain books and uh, journal articles that we subscribe to so that they're only available to Mount students. They're not available to the general public. So to get the, the most information, you want to sign in. And now here, you can see even the first two, we've got like a book, and then the second one is an article. And you may be sort of wondering, okay, what's the difference between books and, and, and articles? Um, in general, the uh, articles tend to come first. So the researchers do their research. They want to try and get that information out quickly. They publish their, well, they get them peer reviewed they get published, they get more feedback in. And then after a couple of years, then they publish um, the books on these topics. The books tend to uh, you know, have an introduction. They tend to have a much more larger view of things, uh, different chapters describing different aspects and the conclusion. So I find that the articles are good for sort of current and sort of a narrow focus. Books are good for an overview, an introduction, uh, sort of the wide scope of a topic. And just because books, you know, they tend to be a couple of hundred pages sometimes, don't think that um, oh, I, can't, I don't have time to read a book. As Elaine was describing, you'll be jumping from, you know, you can jump around between chapters. You can go to the introduction. You can go to the, uh, the conclusion. So you just need to read a chapter in a book. And sometimes that can give you that introduction and overview that isn't present in the journal article. On the other hand, if you need current what's going on now, what are the results of, a, a, you know, a, uh, sort of a research study, then articles are your friends. Great, so we've got them both here. Um, if you want one more than the other, you can use the left-hand side here to narrow down. So you can see here, if I only wanted articles, I can say, OK, just give me the articles. And then we can see that We've got, um, you can take a quick look at the uh, title here just to see a little bit about, okay, you know, what might be related to what I'm looking for. When you look on details, often there's a description and it usually comes from the abstract that gives you a bit more information here that, that's, you know, okay, is it even worth me getting to the full text? And this will allow you to make some judgments about whether you want to go further or not. If you realize, yes, yes, this is something I need to, to definitely read, you may want to go across to the Find Online. And then once we go to the Find Online, we can click here to go to the actual uh, journal article. So it's opening up a new window, and sometimes it takes a little bit of time to connect. On this page again, it's just going to, the abstract that we saw before is going to be there. So just in case that abstract wasn't um, in the, the NobleNet results, you can read it there. And then there's usually another button here to be able to download the PDF. And then we're just saying that we accept their, their conditions, which is usually, you know, they don't want you to just copy and distribute. Remember, these are all uh, special subscriptions that, uh, that we get because we're at the university. So we want to use them for educational purposes. 
and then we've got the uh, journal article. Uh, I know that sometimes scrolling does crazy things on uh, your your Blackboard Collaborate, so I'm just gonna to let it settle for a little bit. But then again, this is exactly the type of thing that uh, Elaine was talking about. You've got your abstract at the bottom. Let's see if I can get to the bottom very quickly. Um, you have, um, well, more sometimes they include the surveys that they used. So you want to, to be able to take a quick look at the, the article. And you can see that we can do this quite quickly, even through the search, just to, to quickly determine if this is worth saving to go back to later. And um, from this screen here, of course, you can, you can print or you can uh, download. So I'm just going to go back to my results. And now we're just going to take a, a quick look at uh, the books. So up at the top here, you can see it said refined by. And there's the uh, resource type articles. I can get rid of that by clicking the little X. And then here, I can see all the different types. So you know, there's videos, there's all sorts of different things. I can say, OK, I just want to see books now. You can see here that we both have, um, you can find online access, the so books that we have online, as well as we've got books in print at the library. For the books in print at the library, this is the number that you want to take note of. You can also find it if you click on find in, in library. And this is where you can find it on the shelf. And if you're not sure, just ask them at the library. They'll be pleased to, to show you how to use this number to find it on the, uh, on the shelf. Um, from here, too, you can see what else is on the shelf. So often, the books on the shelf are in particular subject areas. So there might be things that are close to this book that might be on your same topic so that you can know what to expect once you, you find it. If this book is someone had borrowed it, you can also look to see if it's available at other libraries. And then you can always request it through document delivery to be delivered to you. The document delivery is quite quickly. It's usually about three days, you know, plus or minus. And it's absolutely free. And even if you don't, uh, you're not on campus all the time, maybe you live out in um, Bridgewater, you can order it to the community college that's in Bridgewater and pick it up there and return it there. Or maybe you live in Dartmouth, it's easier for you to get it at the community college in Dartmouth. You can order it to be picked up there for you and return it there too. With the uh, online books, which are really good for, for our distant students, you can see that there's the Find Online. And then you want to be able to click on MSVU Users. Because again, we pay for these by subscription. So we only get the books that you'll see MSV Users, because we paid for those for you. And of course, you paid for them through your course fees. Again, you've got the, uh, the uh, description there. To get to the full text, you just want to click on PDF full text. And I advise not downloading these. When you download the, the books, they, again, have a lot of uh, copyright protection on them. So that you only get to keep them on your computer or a device for one week. And then they, they can no longer be read. And you need to have special software that it's free. You just download it extra. But you need to have these extra bits of software to read it. Whereas if you just read it online, you can you know, quickly go to your, your chapters. And it's always available to you. Um, the only time I download 
is if I'm going to be uh, not where I have uh, easy access to internet or, or Wi-Fi. If I'm on a data plan or something, then I download because, of course, that will be cheaper. But if I have access to free Wi-Fi and the internet, then I read online. And you can see here that um, all our e-books have extra little um, sort of note-taking um, sort of uh, features that you can, as Elaine said, if you want to just keep track of the main ideas, um, you can then use this note-taking um, to do that. With some of our books, you have to sort of create an account so that they can connect your notes to your account. So only you see the notes, no one else. So you do have to sort of sign in so that these online notes are tied to you specifically. But they allow you to um, to actually do quite a bit and to organize and make sort of bookmark your main ideas that will be available to you at any time. So now I do want to give, I know we just have a few minutes, but I just want to just um, see if you can do this yourself. If you can go to the uh, Mount homepage, just type in um, maybe a topic that you're learning about in class and see if you can find a book or a journal article and connect it. And just just let me um, know once you've been able to do that. Or if you haven't, please let us know where you got stuck along the way. So I'm just actually going to set the timer just for, let's just set it for three minutes and just see if you can go to the Mount Library and search for a book or journal article and make sure that you can get to the, uh, the full text of it. And it's just going to, you're going to hear a little uh, ring when the uh, timer is off. But in the meantime, if anyone does it, just let us know in the text box if you've been able to do it.
Okay, so now that you've done a little research and you learned how to um, find something in the uh, library website, I hope you're feeling excited. Um, once you get a kind of a handle on all of this stuff, you'll start to get excited about doing your work and it will be easier for you to do the work because you'll be quicker at doing it. So don't forget to um, not feel overwhelmed by everything we've given you this evening. Consider trying one small thing. So the next time you're looking to get ready to complete an assignment, go in and try to find an article. And if you can't find one, look at the keywords section because maybe the keywords will give you a hint and help you to find an even better article. And so don't look at it as, uh, you know, you needing to get in there and get it and, and come out. Explore, get ready to explore, but keep your criteria in mind, keep your objectives in mind, and use some strategies to be moving through the steps that you need to complete at a much more manageable pace. Um, don't hesitate to let us know if you have any questions. Again, Denise is with the library and Elaine, that's me, I'm the learning strategist on campus. Um, and uh, if you need your learning passport signed, don't hesitate to let us know as well. Does anybody have any questions before we get ready to wrap up for the evening? Okay, and Denise, do you have anything to add before we prepare to sign off? No, just uh, I have my email in the uh, chat box area, and if you have any questions at all, um, please let us know. We always have uh, someone on staff from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Tuesday to Thursday to answer questions, and on the weekends from 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. To, to answer any questions you have about finding or using books and uh, journal articles. And as you can see, it's so easy to use the library to find uh, um, items that are, are relevant to your courses. And that's just for answering the questions. The library, of course, is open longer than that. But if you have questions, we're available during those times. You can uh, phone us. You can email us. You can drop by in person. And we also have the live help chat box as well, if you like chatting. So for the uh, learning passport stamp, there's a survey that uh, the business department would like us to uh, to give to you because they're, of course, reviewing the whole uh, program this year. So once you do the survey, then um, you give us back the survey and we can sign your passport for you. For those of you at a distance, you can email uh, either Elaine or myself. We'll send you the survey and once you return the survey, um, Again, and send us the uh, a scan of your learning passport, and then we'll be able to sign it, scan it, and send it back to you. Yeah, that's right. And um, again, if you have any questions from either of us, don't hesitate to get in touch. And um, we'll stick around online if you have any additional questions. But otherwise, um, thank you very much for attending tonight. I hope you found something useful. <laughs> yes, and if you liked it, we have another session <laughs> coming up at uh, 6 o'clock that's actually going to go a little bit deeper into, you know, writing papers and, and how to do so in a, in a sort of an effective way of doing that and sharing those ideas.
Hello everyone, it's just about 6 o'clock and we're just going to wait for another uh, minute or two uh, before we get started. But uh, thank you for joining us for tonight's uh, session of Academic Integrity, Strategies and Best Practices. Actually, as we're waiting for a uh, couple more people to join us, I wonder if you can just add in the textbook, a textbook, a text box, the little chat box, uh, just what department uh, of faculty, what's your program that you're studying in? Because then we might be able to give a few examples as, as we're um, going through tonight. Thanks, Megan. Thanks for getting it started. Anyone else, if you can just add which program you're in, in the uh, little uh, text box. Okay, great. And we'll just get started now. So just to uh, let you know that tonight's session is sort of a joint uh, session by the Mount Writing Center, the Mount Learning Strategist Office, and the Mount Library, because all three of us uh, are here to help you in this uh, process. I just want to talk a little bit about uh, academic integrity in the news. Every so often you, you see headlines like this. And you'll notice that uh, you never see a headline that says student accused of plagiarism. What you see instead are things like this, sort of, sort of major sort of career um, disasters, really. And you know, you, a lot of times people think as a student that uh, you know, what I do as a student doesn't matter, but it does. As a student, you start adopt, adopting the practices that will carry you through into your careers. And you can see here the, uh, the third one, professional misconduct. When we talk about academic integrity or when you hear about plagiarism, you have to realize we're talking about sort of workplace standards, uh, workplace ethics, and uh, you, you want to be an uh, ethical person and you want to be at the top of your sort of profession and, you know, the, the behavior that would sort of make sure you're doing well in your profession. So you certainly don't want to end up being a, a headline at, at some point. And again, just to get a little bit of feedback from you, um, how many of you have heard the term academic integrity? 
in your classes or in orientations. Yeah, you can, yeah, great, just put up your hand or uh, use a smiley face. You could say a yes. Great. And now I wonder if you could just tell me what do you understand about uh, academic, by the term academic integrity? Again, if you can just write a little uh, one-liner in, uh, in the text box, just what does it mean to you? Yes, Megan, submitting your own work. Yeah, and I think you want to be careful because that's really important and, and it kind of is a nice little segue to this next slide. Uh, you know, this is, these are some of the common sort of comments that people who have then ended up, you know, getting a, a, a charge, which is in, at the university level is uh, academic misconduct. Uh, you hear, but my friend just helped me edit my work. And then what's the difference between sub submitting your own work and getting help? And certainly, you know, having someone you know, check spelling or grammar or make suggestions, that's fine. The problem is where someone starts making <laughs> those changes, that's where you run into it. And you know, you hear, I didn't know I had to cite that, but I thought I'd change the author's words. So again, you want to have that general awareness of, uh, of how to do your work in a, in a way that's high in integrity. And that's what tonight's session is really about. It's sort of strategies for that success, some concrete steps that you can do to ensure that uh, your work is in keeping with academic integrity. And right now, I'm going to turn the, the uh, presentation over to Elaine Johnson, who is a learning strategist at, uh, at the Mount. Hi everyone and welcome for attending. I'm so glad you're here this evening. Um, yeah, we're going to discuss academic integrity and uh, my role and I, you know, as a learning strategist is I help, I help students to study, take notes, you know, read effectively, manage assignments and, you know, uh, manage however, you know, all of the information that they need to learn how to manage effectively. Um, so one of the things that we have to build into our workflow, um, and this is something that we all work at all of the time, so it's not a matter of you being the student and therefore you're not the expert, it's a matter of keeping in the forefront of our thoughts when we do assignments or complete work, um, whether it's on the job or in any setting really, is, uh, you know, what does it actually mean or what should we do to ensure that we are, um, acting with academic integrity and, and how can we make sure that we are giving credit where credit is due and, uh, you know, documenting that so that we can not only know or feel that we've done that, but we can actually show others that we've taken the necessary steps um, and therefore we don't have to worry. Um, and so one of the things that we would or should <laughs> take into account is simply planning our assignments. Um, I guess simply is a word I shouldn't really use when we talk about planning assignments because I'm sure at this point you're all familiar with that feeling of being overwhelmed and um, being expected to manage multiple large tasks uh, simultaneously. And so I always tell students that they are project managers in, in essence because you're managing uh, you know, at least uh, one to five courses at one time, and they all have fairly big expectations. And so one of the, one of the skills that we need to spend time working on uh, when we do have the time is breaking down our assignments so that we have time uh, all the way through uh, timeline to check and see 
uh, or ensure that we are uh, documenting in a proper way so that we know at the end of our assignment or when we've submitted our assignment that we've done everything up to um, that we possibly could do um, to make sure that we've given credit uh, where it's due. So using the text or the tools um, as part of Collaborate or in the system that we're in right now, where do you think on this timeline you might typically start an assignment that is due on March 22nd. Um, and so I'm, I'm, yeah, I have background knowledge that you don't have right now, but I'm curious if you can put a line. Oh, good. <laughs> when would you start? Now, it's uh, assigned on the 15th of January, and it's due on the 22nd of March. Let's see if some more of you can add some lines on this timeline just to see where you might start it. And it doesn't identify who's writing necessarily, so yeah. Feel free to mark it up, mark on that timeline. Good stuff. I wonder why. I wonder why Reading Week is such a popular time to start assignments. <laughs> So wow, I wonder why a professor would actually assign something in January if it's not due until March 22nd. Those curious professors. Ah, okay, I see some interesting lines appearing on our continuum. Now we're getting interesting. Okay, so there is no exact rule for when you should start your assignments. Okay, yeah, that's a good idea, Hugh. Definitely, it's starting to look forward to the end of the semester. Um, but if we have something that's due on March 22nd, um, think of all of the things that would occur in a class or all of the things you would have studied in between January 15th and March 22nd. So that's quite a bit. A lot happens in the run of a week in university. So let's take a look at our next slide and see if I can shed some light on the process of um, planning. So planning your assignments with courses and deadlines in mind means that you have allotted enough time to really understand your assignment. Um, you also might understand or at least have begun to understand the types of information and also the sources that you might require to complete your assignments. So whether or not you may real, or you realize that at this point in time, there is the assignment, but there are also seemingly some implicit parts of those assignments. Um, and ultimately, we want to be spreading those assignment steps out so that we can sustain our curiosity with what we're learning. When we tend to work closer to our deadlines and only start our work then, we get increases in our stress levels, we might get moody, we might forget steps, um, and it usually leaves a bad impression that can have some sort of negative effect on us the next time we attempt an assignment. And so taking the time in advance, maybe even in January at some point, just to understand the assignment, to understand all of the descriptor words that tell you about your assignment, um, as well as understand the formatting um, or the referencing style or the citation style that's expected for that assignment, that would save you a lot of time. But it does take a lot of, um, it does take some experience and it does take a lot of practice. And so that's something I would hope that um, if you take anything away from what I'm telling you tonight is that time is important for you to practice so that you can make some mistakes. And ultimately, more time will allow you to be accurate with your citing. And so therefore, you are taking preventative measures to ensure that you are not, um, not using material in a way that would allow someone to wonder if you maybe are using someone else's ideas or words. So you have to understand your assignment fully. Um, you also want to communicate with your professor. And so I know from being an instructor in various settings that if a student comes to me the week before an assignment and says that they need help with everything, there is not a lot that I can do. 
However, if a student can come to me earlier and say, I don't understand anything about this assignment, I don't know what a citation style is, I can point that student in the right direction, uh, guide the student to do a little bit of very, you know, small steps, small little things, activities, that will build a big understanding at the end of it, and I can give feedback. And so it allows you time to make mistakes and fix them. So there's lots of time in between. Now, I know it's complex for you to be planning multiple things in a term. If uh, that's something that you want to have some guidance on or you need help with or you need a visual to do that, um, I have a lot of recommendations. I can absolutely help you with that. So it's a great time now to get a handle on all of your assignments, so let me know. Um, there are term planners. Um, basically, though, you want to look at doing a task analysis, which means you need to take that big, big task, break it down into smaller steps, and assign a time to each of those smaller steps. So a good rule of thumb, and I'm just going to type as I'm speaking, for every 5% that an assignment or even an exam is worth, um, you might need two to three hours to complete it. And so if you start to think that way, now that's not a, I don't have evidence to support that, but generally if you apply that rule of thumb to um, your assignments, uh, it can be very, very helpful. And so basically to avoid, uh, to avoid plagiarizing, you want to have some really good, strong planning. And if you're not good at planning, you want to plan extra, and you don't want to plan them in longer pieces. You want to plan small little tiny steps so you have lots of room to ask questions, to check the library guidance, to look at different website tools. Um, so I'm assuming, if I just pop back one slide here, I'm assuming if this is due on March 22nd and it was assigned in January, it could be something, um, around, I'm guessing, but maybe around the 20% um, uh, worth for your final course marks or your final grade, give or take. So if we were looking at 20%, you're looking at putting in eight hours. If you have never written a paper before, you might want to look at putting in 10 hours because you also need time to learn uh, the citation style. You might need time to learn how to outline an essay before you start. So the point of all of this is don't feel overwhelmed. We didn't do this uh, presentation last minute. We're doing it now so that now you know and you know who to contact. Um, but even using that rule of thumb, another really good website is the University of Calgary, and I'll type it in at the end. But if you were to go into Google and type in the University of Calgary's assignment tracker, they actually have a tracker online that can help you to learn the steps that you might need to complete your assignments. And so it will not tell you specifically about your exact assignment, but it will help you to learn generally some of the steps that you might need to consider if you're going to do something like an essay or a report or a lab. Um, and it will include some of those steps that you need to consider to ensure that you don't accidentally plagiarize. Because I know even sometimes we don't intend to plagiarize, but because we don't know the proper way to uh, move through an assignment, especially these big essays, we sometimes do. I should note as well that um, even if you are citing your own material, so if you have a paper from last term or last year and you plan to use it this year, you have to cite yourself. So don't forget that as well. Professors might be somewhat lenient with that, but uh, as you move up to second, third, fourth, um, or if you move into your master's level, they will not accept that, and that is plagiarism. So keep that in mind as well. Um, and Again, give that, build that flexibility into your schedule. So where can you get support? You can come and see me. I'm the learning strategist. Um, I will uh, have my contact information in the box for you when I finish speaking, so you can check out my website and know how to contact me. Um, the library has a bevy of resources that you can uh, access, online resources, um, workshops, webinars, and the Writing Center also has, of course, they're the Writing Center, they have 
people that you can uh, speak with to get some real real-time feedback. So if you go to the writing center, take something with you. Take an outline, take an idea. If you come and see me and you're totally stuck and you don't know how to even get started with an idea, well, that's a good place to start. Um, the library, they're not going to help you manage your time, but they're going to help you to pinpoint more specific resources. And so knowing the slight differences between all of these is really yeah, important I'll just well. jump in here and say that uh, at the library, you know, a lot of times we hear people saying, oh, I spent three hours searching, and we go like, we can help you make that a shorter amount of time. <laughs> Your search should be very short and effective so that you have time to read and think. So definitely, when you're looking for resources or trying to decide, you know, is it uh, the type of resource that's acceptable at the university level, then that's when you want to come check in with the library. Absolutely. So we all very, we work together to help students to manage slightly different aspects of your larger tasks as well. And our goal is to not, you know, do, do these things for you. Our goal is to teach you, uh, maybe to give you smaller tasks and try them and come back and build your confidence and your independence as you, as you learn. Um, and so we want to help students avoid academic offenses um, because that's, that's not fun at all. <laughs> um, and so another part of that is organizing your materials because when you have your content and your materials organized very well, um, it's easy for you to know that you have not plagiarized. So it's easy for you to say, here's how I know I didn't because here's the citation. And if you can say something like that to a professor, even if you did make an error, if you're early on in your university career, they can better, or they'll, they'll be better prepared to help you adjust and fix your process a little bit, especially now your professors are the experts in, in your discipline. So they are going to give you that point of view as well. And so um, you want a space for your assignment. So if you're using physical, like concrete materials, paper um, and whatnot, you want to have planned in advance the tools and the methods that you're going to use for doing your assignment. Electronic, which is Honestly, what I would recommend, even if you're using paper, because you can very easily save your citations, back them up, um, it's just a little bit better, even if you are using paper, to have that in place as well. And realistically, you want to be more efficient, more productive with what you're doing. Um, so you want to have a home. And so whatever that home looks like, whether it's something that you can touch with your hand or it's something you can look at and manipulate with a mouse on a computer or with your finger on a screen, um, that should be determined in advance and you can test that stuff out. And if you have issues with your workflow, let me know. Um, in addition, I should add that we also have Hugh. Um, he is a learning strategist who works in the International um, Education Center, which is in the Seton Annex, Wednesdays from 1 to 4. Hugh's a bit of a great guy to have around because he has worked in the Writing Center He's working in the library, and he's working as a learning strategist. So he's like the best of everything. So drop in and see him, and you don't even have to tell him you're coming. Just show up. <laughs> and then you want to read. So you want to choose things that are interesting to you. Don't make it hard. Choose things that you like. Um, you can start with Wikipedia, but that's a great place to start, to sort of, you know, explore. Uh, take the time in that timeline to find things that are interesting to you. Um, but Wikipedia is not enough. It's not the place to stop, and neither is Google, although there are options in Google that you can use. Um, but dig around, do some exploring, look on uh, YouTube for something that might pique your interest. Um, Academia.edu is another place that you can kind of look a little bit to get an idea of what other people are looking at. But ultimately, you've got to come back and look at the standards that our library um, can really help you with as well. So we're all here to support you. Um, know that it's a process and nobody's scrutinizing you. Nobody is uh, saying that you're not good. We all learn and we all practice these skills all the time because if we don't, we get rusty just like you would if you didn't practice. Um, and again, you're refining your process and you're doing, you're doing multiple things at once. So you're, mul you're running multiple uh, courses, but you're, when you're doing one assignment, you're, you're doing two things. You're managing the content 
but you're also looking at managing a good workflow. And so it takes some tact to be able to do all of that. Um, so never, never hesitate to ask any of us. So I'm going to pause and type a few things in your text box there, um, including how you can contact me. And I'm going to hand it back over, I believe, uh, to Denise. Oh, or maybe not. Give me one minute. Ah, OK. Hello, everybody. This is Hugh. And I hope everybody can hear me clearly. This is my, I'll be honest, this is my first time participating in a session. So this is a new experience for me. Oh, I'm glad to hear that everybody can hear me clearly. So uh, yes, my name is Hugh, as Elaine pointed out. And I work both in the library as a research help staff. I'm here on Monday evenings from 5 to 9 p.m., as well as on Friday mornings from 9 to 1. So I'm able to help students or anybody who's on campus with their research needs. I'm also at the International Education Center on Wednesday afternoons from 1 to 4, uh, at which time I do drop-in sessions. So if you have any questions about any of your assignments, about managing them, time management, or organization, you're always welcome to drop by there. And I'm happy to help you with your work as well. So what I'm going to do tonight, um, at this point so far, we've had some different ideas around how to manage one's work so as to avoid um, plagiarism or concerns of that kind. So what I'm going to do now is basically explain what I do. So in addition to working in these different capacities on campus, I'm also a student. I'm a graduate student. And my initial studies when I was an undergraduate student were in uh, the humanities. I studied classics and English. Now I study education. So my writing um, and the, my way of doing research has actually changed over time. And so I say all of this just to point out the fact that there are many different ways of writing assignments, of preparing assignments, and that for any one of us, I think that our style of preparation is going to change over time. And it also depends on the kinds of assignments that we're being asked to write by our professors. So I know that depending on the kind of task I'm working on, I will actually approach it in different ways. And I will prepare and sort information. And I will read in different ways in order to prepare myself for the kinds of assignments that I need to do. So tonight, I'm going to look at, in particular, um, or explain how I would approach writing a research paper. So if I were to do a reflection paper, I might approach it in a different way. If I were doing an interpretation paper, um, for example, when I studied English, I would sometimes have to read a text and interpret it and explain my thoughts about it. Tonight, I'm really looking at the idea of writing a paper where I have to collect some sources ahead of time keep track of them so that when I write a research paper, I have the different information in, in order so that I can access it as appropriately to, or when appropriate, so that I can cite it in my work. So I'm just going to skip to the next slide. So I, I can uh, assume that when you're looking at this, the text is a little bit small. Um, and I apologize for that. Um, what I've done here, on the left-hand side of the screen, you're going to see, or you can see, a journal article. And I basically took a screenshot of the image so that you can see the image. On the right hand, you can see a Word document. Um, what I'm doing here is actually showing you how I transfer information over from the original journal article into a Word document so that I can keep track of the information so that later, when it comes time to write my essay, I actually know where everything is. And I, it's all very well organized and clear so that um, I don't have to worry that I've pulled information in from different um, places that I shouldn't, or I haven't accessed it appropriately. So at the top of the page, you can sort of see uh, on the top left, I'm going to highlight a few things. So here's the information about the journal, the Canadian Social Studies Journal, volume number, um, and so on, as well as the title of the article. 
and the author. So all of this information I'm pulling over into this new document. I've created a citation right at the top of the page. Um, I'm doing this immediately before I really go any further into my assignment so I know where all of the subsequent points that I'm pulling out of the document are um, actually located. So what a lot of students tend to do is wait until the end of a paper and that's when they start kind of plugging in their citations. Um, I work with a lot of students, I've seen them do this, they'll put a quote in a paper or a, a citation, then they'll go back and they'll have to find where that um, information actually was in the first place. This takes a lot of time. Um, so I sort of have developed this different style where I put the citation in a, doc, in a Word document right at the beginning so I know exactly where everything is at. And if I should also point out if this looks a little bit intimidating, please don't let it intimidate you. I um, have developed this style over many years, like writing papers one at a time. I've kind of gotten a, a, a better and better system in place to manage information. But when I was a first year student, uh, second, third year, I certainly had a lot to learn in terms of managing information. So if this is a lo looks like a lot, please um, don't let it overwhelm you. I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to do here is really just pass along the best tips that I know so that if you want to start implementing them for yourself, maybe this is a bit of a shortcut that can help you with your writing. So as I mentioned, I've pulled over the citation information, I've created a citation right about here just so that you can have all of the information um, about the author, the date, the journal, the page numbers, etc. in one place. Now what I, what I did, and let's imagine that this is an assignment where I have to read five articles. Um, what I'm doing, so I actually tend not to like to um, read things online. I'm the sort who if I have to write a paper with five resources um, required for it, I will find those five sources and I will print them off and I will read them. Um, I just find reading on screen for a long time doesn't work for me uh, very ideally. I find it just bothers my eyes and I feel I could be more relaxed if I read things in paper, on paper. So um, let's imagine this document on the left is something that I have read and I've printed out and read in the paper format. Now if you can see on going down the left hand side of it, the, there are some marks, these blue marks. What I've done here and what these are, are basically my way of highlighting important parts of the text. So this blue line, the first blue line actually um, would indicate that all of this information is important. Everything to the right of it is an important quote. Same with the next line and same with the next. These are basically important parts of text that I want to highlight and remember and be able to use at a later point. So once this information is highlighted, I basically copy it over. So this first um, let me see, I'm going to change the marker. So this information then gets brought over here. What I've done, so after I read the whole paper, the whole article in paper format, I open up a PDF copy online and I basically copy the information that's important. So this first line here, I copy it and then I paste it in a Word document. Once I've copied and pasted it, then at the end of it, I put in the citation information. So the author's name, the date, and the page number. So what I'm doing is keeping track of every single quote or citation, important piece of information throughout this article. So I know I've just given a whole bunch of information um, very quickly. Does anybody have any questions before I continue?
And does everything seem clear so far in what I'm explaining? That's right, Sam. So what I'm doing in a lot of ways is kind of creating a doc. I'm putting everything that could go into a paper. So I'm basically reading my, say I have five articles, I'm reading them and I'm pulling out all of the different ideas that could go into a paper. So I think as we read, we're sifting through all of the different information within the article. Some of it might be relevant to a paper we're writing. Some of it might not be so relevant. So basically, each line, I'm basically reading one line at a time and I'm determining what is important and could go in an essay that I would write. And this is my way of just kind of gathering together all of the important information in one place. So again, these are all, all of this, while it looks like there's a lot, it's basically separating out, extracting all of the in important information. And if I skip to the next slide, you can see this would be all of the important details for one article. And again, it, lo it might look like a lot, but remember that I read it, I highlighted the different points, I extracted the information just through copying and pasting. So creating this list of important notes actually only took me a few minutes. But what it does is it concentrates all of the information into one place so that I know all of the main ideas in the article so that when I start writing about it, I know exactly what I'm talking about. Does that help, Sam? Thank you. Yeah, this is my way, like I said, I think everybody has their own way of writing a paper. But again, this is sort of the way that I've developed over time when I have to write bigger and bigger papers of just kind of sifting out the information. So here we have one article. And if we skip to the next slide, this is what it looks like for five articles. So it might look like a lot, but Actually, if you think about it, I've read a whole bunch, I've read five different articles, and let's say each is 20 pages or so, 15 or 20 pages. What I've got at this point is I've sort of cleared out everything from those articles that's not directly relevant to my paper. Yeah, it looks like a lot, but think about it this, the way that I think about it, once I'm at this stage, is like almost everything that's going into my paper is in one place. So, um, Basically, all the quotes, all of the important information, I put it in one place. I think partially because as people, as humans, we can only concentrate on so much information at one time. And by eliminating all of the distracting stuff, we can focus in on what our task actually is. So the highlighted points here, this is one article. And the points that follow um, are all related to that article. Here is a second article. And again, all of the points that follow are related to that article. Here's a third one, here's a fourth one, and here's the fifth one. And you can see that the amount of text that I've pulled out from each article varies depending upon it. Um, there's just depending on what's interesting in the article and what could have been, what is relevant given what my topic is. So any questions so far? And again, you'll notice with each of these yellow highlighted sections, each of these I have created a citation in the proper style um, that my paper is going to be formatted in. And then everything below it, every point below, is also, um, I've highlighted, you know, I've included the author's name, the date, and the page number. So all of these are bits of information that can be incorporated into my paper. So looking at this information, um, what I would then do as a next step, so now that I have all of this information in one place and I know where it is, this to me also 
um, gives me a lot of confidence, actually boosts my confidence when I'm writing a paper because I can see all of this valuable information. I know where it's at. I know where to find it. Um, I know I've done my reading. I can see everything in one place. Um, once I've done this, I read it all again and I start to look for, you know, what are the important themes and ideas and, you know, how could I then go about organizing this information? So usually when we start reading and we have an assignment, we have some general ideas of how to approach the topic or what we're going to be looking for in the articles that we're reading. But at this point, you can go back, read everything, and really see what are the main themes that keeps repeating themselves throughout the quotes and throughout the ideas that you found. So after I read all of these articles um, all over again, um, what I noticed, so I'm, I should have said this a little bit earlier, this paper that I'm talking about is about the topic of standardized assessment or standardized testing. So tests that students have to write maybe across a province, across a state, across a country um, that are basically marking them. And a lot of students don't like these tests and a lot of teachers don't like them either. So as I reread all of those notes, I started to realize, like, first of all, one of the things that I'm trying to explain is what is assessment? So what what is just assessment? Not even standardized assessment, but what does it mean for a teacher to assess a student? Next, I start thinking about what is standardized assessment? So what does it look like when a test becomes standardized? Then I'm also interested in what are the origins of standardized assessment? So as I was reading and taking all of those notes, I realized that these are some of the questions that I'm curious to know. I, and I, I didn't necessarily know them super clearly when I started out um, with my writing, but as I took notes, I realized these are some of the things I'm trying to answer for myself. I started to think about why standardized assessment practices have become prevalent, what are some of the harmful consequences of standardized assessment? So as I was reading all of those articles and taking notes, I realized this is actually probably the biggest focus for my paper. I listed or I included and found a whole bunch of different reasons by a whole bunch of different experts as to why standardized assessment or standardized tests are actually really bad and harmful for people. And finally, I started to also look for information around what standardized assessment practices look like in Nova Scotia today. So, you know, when we're writing papers, we're often encouraged to create an outline, write a thesis statement, then go to find resources which back up what we have to say. But in some, um, I guess in a sense, I'm almost suggesting we do the reverse of that find some resources which are connected to your topic, then read them, and then start to kind of build your paper, look for themes, and then organize those themes in a way that it will become easy to, easy to write it. So once you've identified different questions like this that you can organize your paper around, you can then start to slot the different quotes from the different articles under the different headings, under the different questions. So, for example, with the question, what is assessment, you can see here there are different quotes from different articles that I read that all kind of help answer that question. Under the question, what is standardized assessment, you can see different quotes from different authors as well. And under what are the origins of standardized assessment, and I, this could continue on for multiple, for the rest of the questions, you can see that I'm basically reading and copying and pasting all of the different information underneath the different headings to try to answer those questions. And then what I would st set out to do is actually um, answer these questions in paragraph format or a few paragraphs at a time in, in a way creating a paper that answers these different questions. And I've got lots of information and at this point what I do is also start summarizing and paraphrasing all of this different information. I will start including quotations but largely I'm answering these different questions 
based on the information that I have provided. And again, you can see here's this author, Broom, 2012, page 22. Again, the same author, Broom. Here we move on to Shepherd. Here we have Slump, Comer, Graham and New. So basically, we I could then incorporate all of those into the different paragraphs as I'm answering these different questions and writing a paper. So any questions about any of this? Denise, do you have any questions? No, but it's uh, making a lot of sense, and I'm revisiting even how I'm going to be taking notes from now on. OK. So are, is there anything I could say to clarify? I know it's sort of a whole bunch of information. OK. So it seems, it seems like I, I hope everybody is getting a sense of um, the, the kind of approach that I'm uh, suggesting here. Again, as I say, this, this is an approach that I have developed that works for me. And um, if there are any elements of it that don't seem totally clear or that you would like a little bit more clarification upon, as I mentioned, I work in the library on Monday evenings from 5 to 9 at the Research Help Desk and on Friday mornings 9 to 1 at the Research Help Desk. And as well, I'm in the uh, International Education Center on Wednesday afternoons from 1 to 4 as a learning strategist. And I would be really happy to talk about these kinds of processes in greater depth because I actually find them really interesting. Um, yeah, I find it sort of fascinating how different people write papers and how they organize the information. Because I think once we have things organized in this kind of a fashion, I think it just becomes, for me, I, I feel much more relaxed and at ease. Um, and I can then, I know where everything is at, and then I can go, I can then set out to start the writing with all of the information right in front of me. And this really just helps me, um, again, feel confident that I've done my research. I can see the research that I've done. I think sometimes students will do a lot of reading and then walk away from an article or a book really, um, you know, not knowing where the information is or how to incorporate it or where the important parts are. And so this is a way of just gathering everything into one place, one document, so you can see everything super clearly. And then, as I mentioned, start out to do some writing with this information. So. I'm going to speak a little bit to this slide as well. So originally, Claire, uh, who is in the, uh, who would be the uh, head of the writing center, would have joined us, but she couldn't be here with us this evening. Well, uh, I'll just ask one more time before I move on. Any questions? OK, that's a great point. Thank you. Yeah, so here then we have a few extra points. Um, so Claire, as I mentioned, Claire would have spoken to these. And she talks about another approach is, again, to begin with a simple outline. So what I'm suggesting is almost reading and then creating an outline afterwards. But an alternative is to create a simple outline ahead of time. Um, you can use your outline heading to code or tag your further reading and research. Um, 
For each reading, write a sentence describing how you would use the article or chapter in your assignment. Make notes of page numbers and details like authors, titled books, or journals, names, or dates. So this is a, a method that would involve students taking notes and incorporating them right into an outline. Again, it's different from what I'm suggesting, but it's not to say that I've not written simple outlines in the past and used them as well. And there's an interesting point here on the bottom of the slide which says that it's important for students to evaluate their sources. So are the sources intended uh, for use in the paper appropriate for a university level audience? Do you need to find additional support sources to support your main points? So this is really important. I think we all know or we're, we're learning as university students the importance of using preferably, or for many kinds of assignments, academic sources. There are, all, there are always, on occasion, um, those uh, kinds of papers or essays that we need to write or assignments we need to do that might involve us looking outside of um, academic resources. And those, those assignments are sometimes some of the most fascinating ones where we might look at um, popular culture, we might um, interpret or we might need newer information that we just simply can't find in journal articles. But we always need to be attentive to the kinds of information that we're incorporating into our assignments. So for myself, what I have learned over time now as a graduate student um, is really to start with the academic resources uh, generally because the kinds of papers, the kinds of assignments I need to do require them. But rather than um, search generally and then shift over to academic resources, I have learned to do the opposite and start with the academic resources. And that just generally tends to make my assignments that much stronger. And um, yeah, that's that's been my experience. I think, but again, there are so many different kinds of assignments that students do. It's hard to yeah, make And I think I'm just going to jump in because I know that uh, at the beginning, quite a few people said they were from tourism and from business. And I know it's like super challenging in that program because they do have to analyze, um, you know, like company information and look at like marketing materials and integrate sort of real life information that they're getting from the academic, you know, with academic sources and with academic analysis. So I, I think of all the um, the different programs that. Uh, the uh, tourism and the business programs really have this bringing together of uh, professional, you know, popular and academic sources all at the same time. So just to, you know, to remind you guys that we are really here to support you in deciding what's the best source to use for what you need to do. And I'm just wondering if we could just hear from our students just um, if that's something that that you you have to do in your assignments, Thank you. Uh, let uh, you continue. <laughs> I'm just going to skip to the next slide. Oh, thank you, Megan, and thank you, Tanya, for your comments. I really appreciate that. And, it, and I think, Tanya, your comment speaks to the importance of really, um, too, before we start doing any writing for our assignments, to be attentive to what we're being asked to do. I think sometimes as students we jump into our assignments, but it's really good to pause 
have a really careful look at what we're being asked to do um, because sometimes our, our assignments will send us in different kinds of directions and they'll want us to look at certain kinds of sources or not. And the more attentive we are to the instructions that we're given, the, the easier and the clearer um, I find it is to actually proceed with those assignments. So, yeah. So once a student, once a, anyone for that matter, has written, um, created an outline and, and incorporated notes into their outline, they can write a draft, use their outline and notes as a starting point, making sure to properly cite their sources. They can consult a writing handbook along the way. So again, to point to the fact that there are really different ways of writing assignments, um, writing essays, writing research papers, whether they're for different uh, disciplines or for um, different kinds of assignments. So here's some um, valuable advice as well. Once your paper has been written, it's really important to check that you have cited all your sources. Um, we have citation guides and citation management tools to help you with citation. Uh, one piece of advice that I can offer in this regard is when I reread my papers after I've written them, there's always, there is always the chance that I might have incorporated a few words into it which are too closely those of the original authors. Um, there's always, you know, even when one is trying their best to avoid plagiarizing, there's always the risk that that could happen. So what I've noticed um, in my own writing is that as I read, after I've finished my writing, as I read, I can often notice a shift in voice. So um, basically, I can tell when there are a few words in a set, like in a sentence, if a few words were written by myself, and then there's a shift to a different kind of rhythm, or a different kind of pattern in the writing. I think this is the kind of thing which professors actually often notice, which um, gives them the sense that perhaps some writing has not actually been done by the student. They can actually see or read the shift in tone, the kind of language that's being used. So if once you've finished writing your paper, then you re read it carefully, you can notice sometimes when those shifts occur. And those are usually, they, they might, um, stand out to you or indicate to you that you need to um, go back to that sentence, re-paraphrase, re-summarize, you know, find a way to shift it so that the voice is consistent and that really the voice is consistently yours. Um, I think because, you know, part of doing research assignments or assignments of any kind is really um, we, we have to incorporate information written by others. We're encouraged to. It's valuable to do so. And sometimes it is really difficult to shift those words um, into our own voices because the, the words are really, really important. And changing them would change the whole meaning of the, um, of the information. So sometimes the goal becomes, well, I think for myself at least, keeping things sometimes close to the original in order to respect what was being said in the first place, but shifting it enough that it's not the author's words anymore and that it's ours. So then that means reading very carefully to make sure um, that the work in the end actually has become ours, that we've reworded, rearticulated things sufficiently that um, the final product we could say is ours with um, some input from authors whom we're always citing along the way. So here is a final slide. Maybe Denise, if you'd like to speak yes, to it. Yes, just to say that uh, we just wanted to show you how the, the three uh, sort of department uh, teams work together uh, with your, your paper and, of course, with your professor too. And, of course, uh, if you know someone more in one department, you can ask anyone about this. We'll point you to the right one, right place if we can't help you ourselves. But just know that you have a lot of support for writing your papers and for from 
you know, managing your time, setting out the structure, to finding uh, articles or information sources, to, uh, you know, creating the outline, to actually writing the paper. So we're, we're here for you and know that you'll probably see you in each of the different departments as well. And uh, if you have any questions, let us know. And what I'm going to do now, before we all part ways, is type in the text box below just some of the places that you can find me. Because again, as I said, I would love to chat about these things. Um, when you're writing a paper, just how do you conceptualize it? How do you break it down and start organizing it? I, I think that's really quite interesting. It says here on the slide that questions about the assignment, you can contact your professor. But you can also ask me for advice too, if you like. So, um, but ideally, your professor is definitely the number one person who um, has the most knowledge and uh, about that. But yes, I'm going to put my where you can find me in the text box, um, just so that. And please feel free to drop by and say hi and let me know how your assignments are going. <laughs>